Welcome to this edition of Talking Outdoors. I'm Ramir Sam, the team leader with Life Happens Outdoors. And today we are talking about the Aconcagua Expedition, highest mountain in the Americas. So a typical day on Aconcagua is not what we do on the summit day. That's a separate thing and we're gonna talk about that in a moment. But a typical day on the on the Aconcagua expedition is one in which we wake up normally around 6.30, we have breakfast, uh, we take our time, we start our day on the trail. Uh, that's of course assuming we're going from one camp to another because a big chunk of this expedition is actually spent in uh, in camps that are that are that are fixed for multiple nights, such as Plaza de Mulas, which is considered the, the base camp of uh, of Aconcagua, where we spend multiple nights uh, chilling out over there. But if it's a moving day, we typically start around six thirty. Uh, we'd be you know on the trail around eight. Uh, we would be stopping along the trail for lunch, for breaks, etc. And normally we would arrive around three to four in the afternoon. Uh, on the days where we are staying in our place, we can wake up normally. You know, I mean, we all wake up with the sunshine. So when the sun comes up, we'd normally be waking up around 637. Uh, but then it's a day, you know, we have a big chunk of this itinerary where we're just acclimatizing in place. So we spend our day at the camp, you know, living the camp life, enjoying the views of the mountain, uh, going in and out of the mess tent and uh, just having a great, uh, you know, great experience being up in high altitude without, you know, all the, the buzzing and the phones and all of that uh, happening around us. For summit, it's a little bit different. Uh, we typically start very early in the morning, so we're we're talking about usually uh, close to midnight, maybe a little bit earlier, maybe a little bit later, depending on the pace of the group. Um, and then we walk through the night, climb through the night to get to the summit, uh, normally a little bit past sunrise, and then make our way back down. So that would be a big exception to otherwise days that are spent typically starting at around 6 a.m. and finishing around 4 or 5 p.m. So Aconcagua is a high altitude expedition. And when we say high, we mean pretty high. Like uh, it's, we're, we're, we're almost at 7,000 meters. We're literally a few meters from 7,000 meters. That's how high this mountain is. Um, so it's always a good idea to have some experience with being at altitude, uh, whether it's Kilimanjaro or it's any other big mountain where you have that exposure because Aconcagua is a very big achievement and it's a very physically demanding trip. And if this is the first time you ever go to altitude or you ever experience something like this, it can, it's, quite the, it's quite a shock because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's really something that's very difficult to describe to people who haven't already put themselves in some, a somewhat similar environment. From a technical perspective, there are no real technical requirements on the classic route, the normal route that we take to Aconcagua. Uh, so that means that you don't need to have prior crampon, ice axe, and you know, technical gear knowledge. Whatever you need for this trip is something you're going to learn on the trip itself. But for uh, to have a general idea and to have good expectations for a mountain like this, we would recommend having some trekking experience um, in altitude before coming and choosing to go to the highest mountain in the Americas. So in terms of, you know, from a, from a challenge perspective, a physical challenge perspective, Aconcagua is one of the most challenging expeditions that anybody would put themselves through. It's, uh, it's, a, it's very long, it's very arduous, it's a high altitude for a big portion of the, of the trip. So having good physical uh, abilities for an expedition like this is pretty important. So what does that mean, basically? Uh, doesn't mean that you need to be a super athlete and that if you're not, you know, running 42k on a weekly basis, this isn't for you. That's not what I'm saying at all. But what I am saying is that you should be in a space where you're able to work your way up to some kind of, uh, you know, athletic sport uh, four to five times a week in the lead up to this to this trip. Uh, I would say cardio focus is really important. So some, you know, anything that you have nearby to you, you know, that, that's accessible to you. So running, trekking, cycling, climbing, swimming, whatever, whatever is available to you, you know, spinning, focus, focus on that and try to build that up to four to five times a week to be in the zone for an experience like this. It doesn't mean that you need to be a super athlete. It doesn't need to be mean that you need to be, you know, you know, 
biceps and all that's not what this is about what we're really saying is you need to be in the right mental state and the only way you're going to be in the right mental state for an expedition like this is to be in a in a physical shape that allows your mind to feel confident to go for something like this and that's what we're saying and that can mean something different for different people but to break it down and to make it as simple as possible and to try to answer this question in a way that everybody can understand who's watching i would say that you want to bring yourself to be able to do some kind of sport four to five times a week in the lead up to this expedition. Not saying that you need to be doing this in your daily life, but as you're moving towards this expedition, as we're getting closer to the dates, you should be working your way into that space where you're doing one hour, four to five times a week of some kind of higher intensity exercise that really brings your heart rate up and gets you used to moving a little bit at pace and get comfortable with that, with that, with that feeling of being uncomfortable and yet still having to perform. So Aconcagua's temperature is, <laughs> it's on the spectrum of every which way and up and down and in and out. The big challenge with Aconcagua is actually the wind, right? So in the Andes in general, it's wind, but Aconcagua in particular, there's just nothing to, to shield it from the wind. And so that really has an effect on the temperature. We can have every temperature on this expedition. You could be at Plaza de Mulas and be having, you know, chilling out, watching the glacier, at midday in shorts and tanning, that's very possible. And you could also be in Plaza, way lower down than Plaza de Mulas and be in you know, your thickest summit down suit and jacket and all of that because it's just the weather has, is, 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 is being quite special. So you can expect highs to be mid twenties, even higher if we have no wind and it's a sunny day. Uh, and then you can expect lows to definitely dip well below zero. And that's especially on summit day. What I would say about the, the gear is that, and, and what I would say, sorry, about temperature is to stick to the gear list. Uh, the gear list has everything for every eventuality. So whether it rains, whether it's snowing, whether it's windy, what you have in the gear list is what you need for this expedition to get you through all the different days. Expect it to snow, expect it to be warm, expect it to be windy, expect it to be rainy, expect it to be dusty, but everything that you need to, to deal with all of that is actually in your gear list. So I wouldn't worry too much about what the individual days are going to be like. Um, you, we, we might go on this ex expedition and have no wind and no cold, or we might get only wind and only cold. It's, it's, it's all entirely possible. We're in the mountains and the highest mountains of the world, at, you know, at the end of, at the end of the day. So, um, everything is possible, but we are climbing within the dry season, the season where it's, you know, the high season for Aconcagua. That's when LHO runs expeditions. So we expect the weather to be on the more milder and more manageable side for sure. So in, uh, Mendoza and on our way to the uh, Aconcagua National Park, we are staying in uh, different kinds of hotels. Um, they are, you know, your typical, I would say, comfortable hotels. So private room, private bathroom, uh, restaurant uh, as part of the accommodation. Uh, very comfortable uh, indeed, especially when you have expedition sitting in your mind and then you arrive there and you find it's actually, hey, this is actually not too bad. Uh, but once we get onto the trail, we are now exclusively in tents. So once we're inside the national park and we start to climb up to the various camps and uh, Plaza de Mulas onwards, we are, of course, in uh, in our technical tents. The technical tents are are very good. So um, they are we typically go two by two, uh, but you can have a single tent up to Plaza de Mulas only. Um, I'll explain a little bit about why that is, why we don't do beyond that in a moment. But um, and then in, in, in every uh, campsite, we have a mess tent. So that's a common tent where we can have uh, meals together and chill out together. And then at, in our main base camp, Plaza de Mulas, we have a permanent setup over there with our partners where we have the big dome tents that, you know, kind of community tents. People can come together even from other expeditions. Um, there are toilet tents, shower tents. Um, it's a kind of like a mini city as well. So and it has that vibe and it's really cool. Um, so that's what you can, what you can expect there. And then once we get up to higher altitudes, so we're going to camp one, two, and three above Plaza de Mulas, it's a little bit more restricted. So we don't have the shower tents and all of that anymore. Um, it's just exclusively our individual tents, but we don't spend that much time in the higher spaces. That's only when we're actually doing a rotation or we're going for the summit. The most amount of time 
on this expedition is spent at Plaza de Muros, which is the most comfortable camp um, that we have. Uh, I would say almost on, on any of our expeditions, to be honest. So single accommodation is possible for the hotels. It's also possible for all the tented portion of the experience up until Plaza de Mulas. We don't allow single accommodation above Plaza de Mulas. We keep it two by two. The reason why we do that is because above Plaza de Mulas, we are sleeping at high altitude. And so in case somebody doesn't feel well at night or is you know not reacting well to altitude while the rest of us are asleep, Having somebody in the tent to share is really important because then we can constantly be checking on each other. For So that's why for your safety and for the safety of the team, it's really important that above Plaza de Mulas, we stay two by two in our tents. Um, we don't have single accommodation for that. So any single accommodation that you're purchasing as an add-on would be exclusively up to Plaza de Mulas, including, of course, the hotel accommodation in Mendoza and elsewhere. But above that, um, it will not be a single. It will be two by two. So we're going to almost seven kilometers into the sky. And so naturally there is definitely a concern about being at high altitude and its effect on our physiology. Uh, the way that we run this expedition, so we have a long form expedition. We're not trying to do this. We're not cutting corners. We're not trying to do this in a fast sprint by any stretch of the imagination. We have the longest possible opportunity on the mountain, which gives us a lot of time to acclimatize. Acclimatization means allowing our body to get used to being at high altitude. We have a lot of videos and a lot of uh, stuff on our blog that talks exclusively about acclimatization and the medications and how we think um, these should interact one with the other. Uh, and I highly recommend that you go into that. I'm not gonna go into that in any great detail right now. But what I will say is that um, the way that this, the, the itinerary is run is that we have a lot of time to acclimatize. Our bodies are given that opportunity. We have a lot of time to rest and recover. We also have opportunities where if acclimatization is not possible on the first rotation, we have enough time to go down, recover, and give it another try as well. So it, we, it is really built into this itinerary that we are assuming that, that altitude may be an issue. And we're not trying to cut any corners or circumvent it or try to be fast or, you know, make it seem like it's possible to do it in a shorter amount of time than, than we believe that it is. Um, and that's why we have our, our, our Aconcagua expedition built in the way that we do. Um, so altitude is an issue, but we most definitely are, uh, are, are, are uh, have built into the itinerary you know, preparing for it, but we also, and we also have, of course, everything that we need in terms of medication, in terms of expertise, in terms of checking, uh, you know, doing health checks on a daily basis and knowing what to look for in order for us to get ahead of any issues that we have with altitude rather than be reacting to it. So what we don't want to do is we don't want to say, oh, we have a problem and therefore we need to plan in, in function. What we'd rather do is anticipate the problem ahead of time and ensure that we don't actually reach that point because after that point, you know, it becomes, we, we, we turn an experience that's supposed to be beautiful into something that can be quite, quite, uh, quite challenging and difficult to, to, to cope with. So that's, that's what I'd say on that. Uh, you do need technical climbing gear for the uh, summit push of Aconcagua. Now, if there is snow lower down in altitude, we may need to use it, you know, crampons and the like, in order for us to be able to go uh, up into the, into, you know, uh, at the sections where there is snow, so we're not sliding or anything like that. But typically, uh, on when it, when it's dry, we don't really need it until the summit push. And when we're talking about technical gear here, what we're talking about is crampons, ice axe, uh, harness, uh, helmet, you know, all all the. Uh, uh, um, uh, mountaineering boots and, and the like. Below, in the lower altitude, you just need regular trekking stuff. So trekking poles, trekking shoes, and uh, and the trekking clothes, of course. Everything that you need is in the gear list, and it is uh, and and it's very well marked with the number of the different items that you need, so that you make sure that you have exactly what you need for this trip, and you're not over carrying because that's a bit annoying. Is to go through a bunch of stuff you don't need when you're opening your duffel bags and things like that, especially in higher altitude when you're tired. Um, but also, uh, but also not to underpack and miss key items that you actually need. So stick to the gear list is what I would say.
it is definitely possible to rent gear. Um, if you have uh, missing technical gear, that's perfectly fine. We can get that for you in Mendoza. Uh, what we would find a little bit more difficult to rent would be personal clothes. So we try our best to get, you know, to have what we need in terms of clothes on us. You can check the gear list. If you need help with shopping, we're happy to do that for you as well. If this is your first technical experience, then please don't buy the technical gear. Rent them locally because what you would need for this mountain is very different from what you would need if, say, you wanted to go and do an alpine climb in the summer, or maybe you want to go even higher and do a more technical climb afterwards. And because gear has become super specialized, uh, knowing what you want to do with it will allow you to buy the right thing that will give you the longest you know, lifespan for that gear. So you'd actually use it uh, during its lifespan rather than have it sitting around until your next, you know, similar climb to Aconcagua, which may not be the next climb or the climb after that. Um, so definitely, if this is your first time with technical gear, come rent. And then if you want to buy something, talk to us and we'll help, you know, based on what we know about you, based on what we see you want to do, you know, in the coming uh, years, we would be able to make more specific recommendations to you as to what to buy. Uh, technical training for this trip is included as part of the itinerary. So you will learn how to use the gear in a basic way in order to be able to safely uh, go for the summit and for this itinerary. Um, we would, of course, always recommend that if you're looking to go down the route of technical climbing, that this isn't just a one off, that you should definitely look at joining us perhaps in a, in a lower altitude environment like in Chamonix or in the Alps, where we have a lot of uh, learning and skills based courses that will teach you not just how to do a particular itinerary like Aconcagua, but how to open up the world of mountaineering and to enable you not just to be somebody who's there following the guide, but to participate in the decision-making process of what it is that you want to achieve in high altitude and in the mountainous environments of the world. So what goes into the day pack is what you would have been briefed on the previous night. So every night you have a briefing with your team leaders and your guides, and they will tell you exactly what you need to pack in your day pack. And that's what goes into your day pack. So it's usually your water, your uh, your uh, your uh, uh, extra layers, waterproof layers, things like that. And what goes into the duffel bags and the stuff that's sent up to the to the to, to base camp and elsewhere, um, that's what you don't need for that particular day. And that has your layers for later later days or your technical gear that you don't need for the trekking days, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, every night you'll be told what to do. Your backpack would not normally have more than five to six kilos in it um, for, for, the, for the trekking portions. Of course, when you're going up to camp one, two, and three above Plaza de Mulas, your bags may be a little bit heavier because you'll be carrying your things for the following three days when you're doing your summit rotation. That's uh, so that's something to consider. But normally, it, even then, it's not that heavy because you will be very, very particular and your team leaders and guides will be very particular in helping you pack and select the right things that you need um, for the higher altitude pushes. Uh, so drinking water is sourced at uh, various streams within the national park. It's then boiled and treated and served to you. That's, of course, when we're up in the higher altitudes. Down lower down in the mountains, um, we have bottled water available at all times. Um, so we're talking here about when we're down in uh, Mendoza and, uh, and, and before we actually enter the national park. But once we're up there, lots of streams, lots of beautiful streams, and uh, our teams will be going to source that water for us boil it, treat it, and you'll have wonderful mountain water to support your hydration on the way up to the summit of Aconcagua. So internet situation on Aconcagua is uh, on and off, basically. Uh, so when we're in Mendoza and until we check into the national park, there is, of course, uh, a connection. Uh, whether it's Wi-Fi in the accommodation or it's a network connection. As we go up onto the trail, we will lose connection, uh, but there is connection at Plaza de Mulas, which is where we spend the vast majority of our time. So there is Wi-Fi connection there and particular points where we can go to actually get connection. Sometimes there is a, there could be a charge on the Wi-Fi. Most times we, it's, it's, it, it, there isn't, but sometimes there is. So it's important just to keep that in mind. 
Um, so there will be connection uh, for that period of time. Once you get up into higher altitudes, so uh, uh, we're talking about uh, uh, Camp 1, Camp 2, and Camp 3, there will be no connection. So the vast majority of this of the nights are spent in Plaza de Mouros there. You will have connection. Lower down in altitude, there is connection. But you have to imagine that once we get on the summit rotations, there are there's no connection there. Good news is uh, we have LHO Base Camp, uh, and LHO Base Camp is here to keep your loved ones informed of everything that's going on. We have regular connection with the expedition leader, uh, uh, whether it's via satellite phone or whether it's uh, it, it, with speaking to Plaza de Mulos and getting information from them as to what's happening with our expedition higher up in the mountains. So what we will provide you with is a phone number that your loved ones can contact to find out what's going on with you. We would not, of course, be able to relay, you know, pictures and direct information that's, you know, very, very specific, but we will be able to let them know that you're fine, where you are roughly on the mountain, and when they can expect to hear from you next. Um, and that's something that we provide all of our Life Happens Outdoors trips. So Aconcagua is the highest mountain in the Americas, and I mean both Americas, right? So it is the highest mountain in South America, but it's also the highest mountain in both the Americas combined. Uh, and it is the highest mountain outside of the Himalayas. So it is one of the largest mountains in the world. And of course, it's one of the seven summits. So every continent has its highest mountain and Aconcagua is, is one of those seven summits. It's gigantic. It's spectacular. It sits on a range of mountains that is some of the most beautiful uh, mountain experiences on the world. The Andes are my, by far my favorite mountain range in the world. Uh, I have a soft spot for them, whether it be in Ecuador, in Argentina, in, in, uh, in, uh, in Peru or in, uh, Chile. The Andes range is just something that's out of this world and the vibes are beautiful. So th we're talking about the crown jewel, the biggest mountain of one of the most spectacular mountain ranges on the planet and actually it's the longest mountain range on the planet that starts all the way up in Colombia and ends all the way down at the at the Magellan Straits. Um, it's really something, setting aside the seven summits, that's not something that really interests me personally. Um, I know that it's a, it's a big motivating factor, but setting that aside, the mountain in its own right is something, it's a force to be reckoned with. It's gigantic, it's a huge personal achievement. And it's something that I think anybody who wants a taste of the real high altitude will have to go to at some point in order to have that experience.